Good morning, WTOB listeners. This is Dylan Greenwood and Harold Eustache of Greenwood Law here to bring you For the Record with Greenwood Law. And today we're going to be talking about gun rights. It's the beginning of a two-part series. We'd originally planned to talk about concealed carry permits, gun permits, all the stuff involving that, the laws and everything that uh, surround those two issues. But we're going to switch tracks a little bit today and we're going to be talking about other aspects of firearm rights and how those might be taken away. Reason why is, is we might be having a very special guest with us next week. We're really excited about it. Uh, so we thought it would be uh, pertinent for our listeners to have that opportunity. So we're switching over. And uh, Harold? Yes, yeah, so gun rights obviously are, are very sacred in our country and, and very important to many, many citizens and residents of North Carolina. And um, there's several ways that these rights can be taken away um, temporarily. Uh, because of because of your interaction with the court system so the first way that you know we traditionally think about that is with uh, felony conviction Um, and so the felony conviction can be under state or federal law as far as the rights being taken away so under state law in North Carolina if you have a felony conviction for any conviction that is a felony and it doesn't have to be uh, a violent felony it can be a nonviolent felony as well. Um, your gun rights, your right to possess guns, to purchase guns, to possess ammunition, uh, to purchase ammunition, to transfer guns, um, that, those rights will be taken away. Um, and in, under federal law, if you are uh, convicted of a crime in which the sentence could be one year or more, so the federal law doesn't really say technically felony, It says, uh, convicted of a crime that you could be sentenced one year or more, uh, your gun rights uh, could be taken away. Yeah, that was actually a big issue back in 2013. There was mm -hmm. a big appellate case that came down that ironed that out. It really affected a lot of what are called armed career criminals. Yes. And that's a federal enhancement that happens if you have a certain number of violent felonies in your past. And I think a lot of people would be... Um, surprised to know what constitutes a violent felony Mm -hmm. when it gets down to it and on your third time uh, if you have a gun that's involved and you're possessing it uh, after you've been convicted of a felony then all of a sudden it can trigger a mandatory 15 year sentence and that's a heavy uh, toll that it takes on uh, people when that happens Um, so you're exactly right but Harold, just because you were convicted of a felony, um, is it automatically a, a permanent revocation of your uh, gun rights, or are there some felony convictions that allow you to get your gun rights back and some that don't? Um, y- well, it you can get your you can petition the court to get your gun rights back after twenty years of being finished with your sentence essentially. So um, if you are convicted of a felony and you you were put on, let's say you have a a year year long sentence, it could be in custody or it could be a suspended sentence. Um, At the expiration of all of your obligations with that sentence, that is when um, that time starts for you to be able to, for 20 years later, petition the court um, in order to uh, have your gun rights restored, but part of what we talked about last week um, may have an effect on that, right, Dylan? That's exactly right. So there is a mechanism in state law and in federal law that if your uh, felony conviction has been expunged, then it might be a short circuit way to get your gun rights back uh, because both aspects of law and you do have to worry about state law and federal law you know we live in a country where there are two systems of government Uh, you fall as a citizen of the United States and then as a citizen of whatever state that you live in you fall under both forms of government so for residents of North Carolina you have to abide by federal law and you have to abide by state law now the federal law the US Constitution says that Federal law is supreme mm-hmm. to whatever state laws that there are, but uh, 
you know, there are times that it doesn't exactly jive, and, and this is an area of the law where it doesn't necessarily line up. Uh, and, and that's fine. It's just we know that federal law tends to trump whatever's going on. But mm-hmm. per the Second Chance Act of North Carolina, there is now a door that's open, and we talked about this extensively last week, for certain nonviolent felonies to be expunged after 10 years if it's your only conviction. And that is a big deal because if it is your only conviction for a nonviolent felony, which you, if you're going to petition to have your gun rights back, uh, the statute that lays that out says that it has to be your only conviction. It has to be nonviolent. And the definition of nonviolent in the gun right petition statute and in the Second Chance Act statute actually are different. They're they're a little different. And the Second Chance Act uh, requirement for nonviolent felony is actually uh, more stringent Mm -hmm. of what it constitutes. So you're actually meeting a higher burden if you're going to be successful at one of those expunctions. But there's an avenue through state law and through federal law that if you get an expungement of the one singular felony that you've been convicted of or the or a same group of felonies that happen in the same occurrence that mm-hmm. were all adjudicated on the same date. Those right. count as one. Right. If you get all of that expunged, then it is a way to short circuit by about 10 years to get your uh, gun rights back. That's right. And if you were one of the people that, let's say you didn't get it expunged and you wanted to petition for your gun rights back, there is a, a method to do that. Um, you would have to uh, you generally would need an attorney. There's quite a few um, things that the court considers that are part of the statute that would need to be looked at. We can just go through a couple of them. Um, you can't be a fugitive. You can't um, be addicted to uh, uh, alcohol, drugs, and other substances. Um, you have to have, if you were in the armed forces, you have to have, uh, cannot have been dishonorably discharged. You can't have, this is important too, you can't have a PJC. Um, What's a PJC here? As a prayer for judgment continued. So there are instances where the court um, would continue judgment for various reasons in some sort of uh, in some sort of uh, crime. Um, but th- this, for these purposes, you cannot. Th- that would count um, to bar you from being able to do this if it's a misdemeanor crime of violence. So if it's a simple assault and you got a PJC for that. Um, that would bar you from this. And that's the quickest avenue if you're a citizen of North Carolina, which mm-hmm. to petition, you've got to be a citizen for a year. Right. And it typically involves, the easiest path, rather, is when it's an in-state conviction. So it's a conviction from North Carolina mm-hmm. because there's this unclear aspect of the law where you have an out-of-state felony conviction And then you move to North Carolina and because we get calls about this all the time Mm -hmm. because we get calls about this in relation to gun rights and in relation to petitions to get off the sex offender registry. Right. And this this what I'm about to describe really pertains to both. But what happens is if you have an out of state felony conviction, if that state does not allow for gun rights to be restored through petition, then you're not allowed to go down this road. Now, if it does, you have to then, even though you've moved to North Carolina, you have to abide by the time requirement in the state in which you were convicted in. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, on the back end, you have to abide by North Carolina's time requirement. So instead of it just being 20 years, you're done with your 20 years post uh, completion of your entire sentence, it can be up to 40 years potentially, depending upon what the other state says your time requirement has to be. And that is a weird little mechanism in the law that, again, we see it's applied not just mm-hmm. in gun rights, but in other areas as well. Um, but, you know, when you're looking at these, you got to make sure that you've lived here. you got to make sure that it's a nonviolent felony. A nonviolent felony is one in which assault is not a part of the crime in which a gun is not a part of the crime, the elements of the crime, and whether whether or not you would have to register as a sex offender. That cannot be a part of it. If any of those apply, then 
this is not up um, this is not a right that you could potentially restore and you're looking at your gun rights being permanently revoked and that's for all firearms that's what a lot of people don't understand uh, in fact I've seen cases where um, guy old elderly individual uh, up near his 80s uh, had a felony from 50 years ago thought he'd had his gun rights restored because there was a period of time in North Carolina that it was easier to happen than others mm -hmm. and a lot of people thought they had the rights restored and they really hadn't and then all of a sudden the law changed and all this stuff applied to them. This person ended up having their house broken into, police came and investigated and the old man kept a little 22 above the door sill of uh, the kitchen and him and his uh, grandson would go out plunking stuff in the backyard because they lived out in the country mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they ran his record, looked at it, and all of a sudden, he ended up facing a possession of firearm by felon charge because of that little twenty-two that he had uh, for his grandson because he was a convicted felon. He had not gotten his gun rights restored properly, and it's really fraught with a lot of consequences because that case, believe it or not, actually went federal. And it was just it, mind blowing that uh, that case ended up going federal, and that something like that, where he was facing such um, strict penalties through the federal system, uh, just knowing that whole case in its totality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is something you want to make sure that you're paying attention to. It's not just for pistols. It's not just any for firearm, it's yep. any firearms, including long guns, rifles. It doesn't matter what and caliber ammunition. and ammunition. There's so a if case. You had, if you had just yeah one round. Next yeah, year. one round of ammunition. Because there was a case that we had where it was a possession of a firearm by felon charge where the fingerprints were on the magazine, but they weren't on the gun. They weren't on the ammunition. And you know what? That's not possession of firearm by felon at that point. Because it's not illegal per the laws of North Carolina and the federal government to possess a magazine or a clip. Mm -hmm. It's illegal to possess the ammunition right. and to possess the firearm. So that's the difference. So Harold, felony convictions, while they're probably the most well-known way to mm -hmm. lose your gun rights, it perhaps isn't the most common way a citizen could lose their gun rights, is it? No, there's another way someone can lose their gun rights, and that's through um, a domestic violence conviction or a domestic violence protective order. Um, which are two different things, but first we'll start with the domestic violence convictions. Um, and those, those apply to, uh, those are state convictions generally, but they apply to the federal law. So this is sort of an, an interesting part of the law because if in, in North Carolina, there aren't necessarily domestic violence crimes per se. There are crimes that um, typically involve it can involve domestic violence like assault on a female but assault on a female can be a non-domestic crime and so that that what that means is that if somebody assaults a random female but doesn't have a domestic relationship with them they could be convicted of assault on a female but it is not a domestic violence crime under the federal law and how is it determined then if it's that ambiguous how is it determined whether or not it's domestic violence or not so on the way that it's determined is the nature of the relationship um, between the parties so if the parties are in a domestic relationship meaning they have lived together um, they've had a dating relationship they are uh, spouses or ex-spouses um, if they are children parent relationships um, those are all domestic relationships uh, under federal law that would apply if somebody was convicted um, to bar them under federal law from uh, possessing or purchasing or owning a firearm. So, Harold, do you, with domestic violence crimes, do you have to be convicted of the crime for it to compromise your gun rights, or does just the fact that you were just charged in the first place, does that play into it? If you do have a pending charge uh, for a domestic violence crime, it can affect your gun rights. Uh, if you went to uh, purchase, uh, well, if you went to apply for a concealed carry permit 
uh, with the sheriff's department, they would ask you or a pistol you, permit if, or a pistol purchase permit. If you they would ask you if you've been if, if you've been charged with a crime it, uh, of domestic violence, and that m would very likely bar you from uh, receiving one of those permits that you would need. In addition, um, if you go to purchase a, a long rifle um, at a local gun store, uh, you'll have to go through an NICS background, a federal background check. And in that federal background check, it does uh, check whether or not you have a domestic violence uh, conviction. And because these are national and every state has different um, standards for what that is, um, they, they err on the side of caution uh, in those national checks. And it, the, the, you could have a review um, period which would bar you, at least initially, from purchasing a long rifle. Um, from a gun store or a gun show. And you've gone through that review process with a client before, haven't you? Sure, I have. Yes, I have. Yeah, and how did that go? Um, it, it, it does take a little bit of time to go through uh, and, and, and essentially convince the federal government that, that whatever was hanging up that client is not, in fact, a violation of, um, of the law. And, and again, you know, sometimes, they, again, they, the federal government is going to err on the side of caution when it comes to these sorts of things. Um, and so, but they do allow a person that is applying to, uh, to um, essentially appeal um, those decisions. You know, before you were, when we started talking about domestic violence, you mentioned domestic violence protective orders here in North Carolina. And colloquially, they're often referred to as 50 Bs. Mm -hmm. You can get a 50 B against somebody. And you get a 50B against somebody if you were in a dating relationship or some sort of familial relationship uh, and an act of domestic violence occurred or uh, some form of stalking or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's all laid out in the 50B statute. And it can be, in some ways, it can be a tough burden to meet. And in some ways, it can be a low burden uh, for people to meet because reason why it can be lower is because it's a civil issue the evidentiary standard for it at a hearing is much less uh, than a criminal um, conviction which is beyond a reasonable doubt uh, at a civil hearing it's preponderance of the evidence and so it's a much lower standard but yet the outcomes and the way in which a domestic violence protective order can affect the person it goes against can actually be uh, much more severe than a criminal conviction. Right, and in we, a lot could, of ways. we could probably do a whole show on that. And we <laughs> on might a, at some we point. Might to, <laughs> on all the, uh, the issues that come out of a, a domestic violence protective order, but one of them specific to firearms is that if you are the defendant in a domestic violence protective order, meaning um, you've had one found against you, um, and that you, at that point you would lose not only your ability to uh, purchase firearms, but any firearms that you had in your possession, mm -hmm. that you own, um, you would be ordered to turn them over to the sheriff's department. Um, and, and if you don't, you know, you'd be in violation um, of, that, of that 50B. And that's at the ex parte stage of a that's 50B? That's at the ex parte stage. And at the, right. the, the full, the culmination of the 50B. Sure. Once the you're stage. served with that ex parte, which, so, well, the way it works in a 50B, we don't have to get too much into it, but um, generally you're served with an ex parte order. Um, and if that ex parte order is granted, um, you do have, I believe it's 24 hours to, to turn over your firearms to the sheriff's department. Um, and so there's a whole process for doing that. Once you turn those firearms over, if you are found to have a 50B, which generally lasts a year against you, then you will not be able to possess purchase uh, firearms or ammunition and also your firearms that you own will be in the care of the sheriff's department now after that time is over you are there you are able to petition the court in order to get your fire have your firearms returned to you from the sheriff's department but it is a process that has to go through the courts and that's a drawn out process isn't it it is it can it, be a lot it's of paperwork a that it's a lot of paperwork and it and it, you know it, it can be contested um, on some level, so there, there, there and you part of it is that you have to show the courts that um, the, the behavior that initially led to the 50 50B protective order certainly is not occurring anymore. Uh, that there aren't any pending uh, domestic violence charges uh, against you. So, um, 
so that's that's very important um, for in order for you to get your your actual firearms back but also having that um, domestic violence protective order against you can also open up felony charges if you were to go purchase a firearm so let's say you had a 50b against you and you went to uh, you know a gun store and tried to and tried to attempt to purchase a firearm just attempting to purchase one with a 50b would be a class h felony in north carolina so it opens you know these 50b's can open you up to all sorts of um uh, possible uh, criminal liability for um for just even it, trying to buy a gun it isn't just purchasing it's possessing continuing to possess right. them is at the state level it's a class h felony again mm -hmm. and uh, it has implications in federal law. You can, if you continue to possess these guns after a, a domestic violence protective order, whether at the ex parte stage or at the final stage has been entered, and you continue to possess, then you're facing down a federal firearms charge that can have far-reaching mm -hmm. uh, penalties well beyond anything that a state court can do. So then all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at a situation where you're facing both state penalties and federal pen penalties. And the reason why you could face both is, you know, like we said earlier, we live in a dual system of government and both systems can punish you under their respective laws. And now that doesn't always happen or necessarily happen, but it can and it does. So all of a sudden you're in much more hot water than you ever were before. But if you were going to petition to get your guns back after um, a 50B is either not granted or you finished your one year, um, it's usually good to have an attorney with that because of uh, all the paperwork, right? It is good to have an attorney because there's a process in which you got to go through the clerk's office. You have to go through the, uh, the, the sheriff's department's attorney. Um, uh, and all of, all of those people have to be served. The the plaintiff, the person who initially filed the 50B, also has to be served and has the opportunity to be a part of any hearing that goes in front of the courts. The, those hearings are generally held once a month, and you will be in front in front of a judge um, to explain, uh, you know, why this judge ultimately is the deciding factor in ordering um, your firearms to be returned to you. And that judge can make the decision not to do that. So it's important. Um, to have counsel to be able to navigate that entire process uh, effectively. And a lot of times that, you know, if a 50B was dismissed at some stage or there was a finding that a person wasn't responsible for mm -hmm. the 50B, then a lot of times those uh, guns can be retor returned in a much smoother fashion. A lot of right. times it isn't contested. But you had one here <laughs> recently that... I Although did. the 50B was dismissed, it was still a contested return of the firearms. It was still contested, and, and the plaintiff, of course, as I said earlier, has an opportunity to be heard in court. And so in this particular instance, the plaintiff um, was very adamant that she didn't want the guns returned to, uh, to my client, and, and ultimately um, they, were returned. The, they were returned. The judge understood it because the 50B was dismissed. Yeah. There's one other way um, that's important that we need to talk about uh, that you can lose your firearm rights and that's through an involuntary commitment and that happens sometimes in, in North Carolina if somebody uh, makes a call and they're deemed to not be to be mentally ill in some way and not be able to uh, handle themselves they can be involuntarily committed and that can have an effect on both uh, their ability to purchase firearms and their ability to possess firearms yeah. WTOB listeners we thank you for joining us to talk about uh, your gun rights and how they can be taken away with certain criminal convictions and also how you can get them back and how you can petition the court to get them back. We hope you've enjoyed that discussion. Um, don't forget to join us next Sunday uh, at 10.30 a.m. on WTOB TOB for another For the Record with Greenwood Law where we're going to be discussing uh, uh, concealed carry permits, pistol purchase permits, and hopefully we may have a very special guest to, to help guide us through that. Yeah, absolutely. But before we go, do not forget the Greenwood Law Bill of Rights. And that's first and foremost, I will not represent myself in court. Second, I will not do law enforcement's job for them. Third, I will not make statements when stopped by law enforcement. Four, I will not consent to searches when asked by law enforcement. And five, I will not be my own star witness for the prosecution. Remember everyone, it's not a crime to know your rights. 
Stay safe, stay informed, stay healthy. This is For the Record with Greenwood Law, signing off.